started with a typical little girl who wanted to be a teacher. Grew up with a brother and sister who enjoyed fixing cars and playing in the dirt. And I, I was lucky enough to have a few good teachers who taught me math and science and to enjoy solving problems. It ended up inv inevitably as me being a lecturer at the university, wanting to do something and teach my students to do something epic. We signed up for a challenge to design and build our own solar-powered car. Let me introduce you to Ilanga. She's a pretty little thing, and uh, the guys hate it when I say she's pretty, but it is. And uh, it's, she's been our moon landing. When we started this project, we wanted to, it was an engineering education exercise. We were looking at ways to train our students to have that certain edge that we thought they needed to go out into the world and be successful. We had no idea what we were signing up for. Because we took that one risk, I think we might have been naive. We didn't really know <laughs> what we were signing up for. But we took a risk and we, we went about with the attitude that let's see how far we can take this. The academic requirements was to build a paper design. It, it just had to be a paper design. So a pretty picture on a piece of paper, we didn't have to build it. So academically, I was sure that the students weren't at risk if we completely horribly failed at this. But we really wanted to take this car out into the world. And what Ilanga has taught us is that we need to go out there and develop the skills we require. So from a paper design, it turned into a real car. Ilanga, is the, this is the third version that we've built, so the third generation, completely built by students, undergrads and postgrads working together, and engineers have a very specific skill set. And we had to go out and find the skills we needed, because apart from having to build the car, and that's a big enough task, we had to build an entire program around it to ensure that we can keep this thing going and get it on the road, the logistics behind it we very soon realized that engineering designs was not going to cut it. We needed a pretty picture. We needed something really, really sexy that we could go out there and sell it. We started with a team of six undergrads. They were really dedicated and stubborn enough to, despite all the critics and the cynicism, want to try and do this. And I always thought, well, you know, we'll see how far we get, but I think they truly, truly believed that this is going to get onto the road and we will be racing it across South Africa. From there, we turned into a group of 10, we then became a group of 25. This year, we had 125 kids building their own little cars and racing them around a track to see how far they can get on a litre of fuel. And they go bloody far, they do like 5,000 kilometres. So it's, not a, it's not very exciting to watch. They sort of cruise most of the time. <laughs> but it's, it's so beautiful to see when for the first time a student go from a conceptualizing an idea and developing it and turning it into something real. And when this real thing turns into something that excites people, that sort of people look at you differently when you say, oh, but I build cars. Warren Herter, my project manager, has built eight. <laughs> Every time it's something new, there's no textbook on this, we had to figure it out. We had to go beyond the walls of the faculty, we break down the ivory towers and really ask people to help us. We learned the return on investment kind of thing, you know, what are, what's in it for me? Why should I help you? But if we didn't try, none of the other things would have started, so we had to go out and do something amazing. Where am I? Energy is something that we have become so acutely aware of. Every time the lights goes off, we are taken sort of back into that primal state, being mad <laughs> that it's not there. Do you realize that today, 2.8 billion, that's a whole lot of zeros, 2.8 billion people don't have access to modern electricity supply as you know it. 1.1 billion people don't have access to electricity at all, ever. 620 million people who don't have access to electricity are our neighbors. They live in sub-Saharan Africa. We are part of that number. 97% of rolling blackouts, ro load shedding, happens in sub-Saharan Africa and developing Asia. 
Energy is at the heart of economic growth, of education, of freedom. You cannot develop an e economy if you don't have the power to do that. And it's mind-boggling, because where we are, right here, with what we have, we have the most solar irradiance in the world. Free energy available to us now. Do you realize that solar PV, same kind of stuff we've got on Ilanga there, is cheaper to run power than it is to burn coal, and it's damn cheaper than burning diesel? Do you realize that we can build solar plants in less than a year, but we are investing in nuclear, which is going to take us another 20 years? It's mind-boggling. And yet we have all this opportunity and possibility, and we have these young minds who want to do things like this, people who sign up to do more than what is expected of them, really caring about what they're doing. We talk about being in academia, you're very protected from real life. We get to deal with the people who know what they want, our students are mostly educated, or well, we're working on it, and they, they have a vision of a beautiful future. They really want to give of their time. So we needed our moon landing. The moon landing and the whole NASA space mission did two things. It drove to technology to a point where we have GPS, computer chips, and software to program. All of that was based on the back of a spaceship landing on the moon, but it did something else. It inspired a whole generation, captivating the imagination of a generation wanting to be astronauts and scientists and rocket scientists. And we wanted to create something like that. We need more engineers. We want kids who are excited about technology. And it's actually pretty easy, because technology is exciting. It's beautiful. It, it, it emotes all sorts of energy. When we take this into rural nowhere, the kids are the ones that are first in line to see it and touch it, and how does it work, but where does the wheels go, where's the driver? And they get excited about it. And those were our two goals. We want to drive technology in solar PV, and we want to get kids excited about becoming engineers. We started with in participating in races, and then we went on to plan our own road trips to sort of figure out where our own drives are going to be. We, we UJ, so this is the UJ Solar car, we have the UJ Solar team, and then we went on the African Solar Drive, so you can figure out what we did. We drove around in Africa. We did 4,000 kilometers, we took 25 students from multidisciplinary environments, so not just engineers, we wanted the humanities students, the arts students, the philosophy students come with us so that we can look at new ways of solving problems. Our main goal is to connect engineering to real life such a beautiful example that you have to have a human-centered approach when we are designing. Engineers tend to design for technology. We don't design for people. And only when you get close to the people, when you go outside of the faculty, outside of the country, do we start coming up with beautiful solutions. And when we have the humanities students sitting next to an engineer saying about, but look at what the technology is doing in this situation, that's when we start adding value. We realize that because we didn't have all these skills, it was an advantage, because we got to talk to so many people. And we connected our networks to go far beyond our borders. And as far as we went, we talked about the fact that we want to have clean energy. But we had good arguments about it. It's not just because it's going to make me feel better. It's cheaper, it's cleaner, it's healthier. If you look at the health uh, benefits of not burning coal, of using renewable energy, it just makes so much more sense. But we're not doing it, and we're not insisting on it. And if you remember the map of all the red, that's all the light and the energy available to us. In Germany, they run 60% of their power completely off of solar renewable energy. They have half the solar irradiance that we have, half the available energy, sunlight, to turn into energy. Why can't we use these examples that exist? Why can't we build on that and have that in South Africa today? So we go across borders, talking to kids, talking about the fact that our communities should be doing these things for themselves. We don't need to wait for government to come and do this. When we were in Groblerswerk, close to Uppington in the Northern Cape, there's a beautiful example of a little town where in the informal settlements, in little straw houses, really makeshift little houses, when the power goes off, that informal settlement shines bright because they have little solar PV uh, light bulbs on their rooftops. 
So everything works. They keep going. They've got their fridges running, TV running, all off of solar, solar PV. If a little community in the Danafeld can do that, why are we not doing it in the heart of the city? Why don't we see, if you look over the rooftops, I see so much potential there, but nobody's taking it. And we complain about policy and we talk about government not doing what they're supposed to. Just do it. Take a risk. See what happens. See how far you can take it. And that's what, we, what it's all about. We need to connect people. We need to make sure that we train engineers in a different way. We need to go out there, go beyond the classroom. We need to have the basic background and the theory as a key part of our foundation, but we have to get out of the lab. What works in the lab hardly ever works in real life. Our best stories are when things go horribly wrong. And you'd think be, we'd be better at solar racing. We've built all these cars. We've never won a race, you know, so we, <laughs> we always have something that happens. But it creates this wonderful opportunity for the students to develop and grow and learn and just keep on at it. So the can-do attitude is a really important thing in our lives. Getting back to the kids. If we take 100 kids who enrolled into school 12 years ago, 48 of them will make it to the 12th grade. Only 36 of them will pass. Of that 36, we have 14 that will make it into university. How many of them do you think choose a career in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? How many of them step up to that? We live in a country where we are encouraging our kids to do the easy math. We allow them to disappear into the cracks. We don't give them the dream, that hope, the idea that I can become something bigger, something better, despite my circumstance. And there are beautiful examples of kids doing exactly that, rising up above the dust. But those are just some examples. The reality is that we are losing more than 500 million of those kids every year. Where do they go? And how can we allow that? when we can excite them with technology like this. So Ilanga goes out and she talks to kids. The students participate, and while we're doing that, the skill, we develop other skills, new skills. We get them excited, we get them involved, we get them doing stuff, planting those little seeds that the impossible things, those are the worthwhile things to try, because it's really fun when you get it right. We have to keep on going out. We have to keep on talking about the things that are impossible that we're getting right. We never hear about it. Only when you come to a forum like this, there's all these wonderful examples. And you're like, why didn't I know about these things? Because we don't talk about it. We need to get to a point where we can engineer a future that we are willing to live with. Energy is one of the wicked problems. Wicked problems are these things that you just can't solve. There's no ideal state that we're going to end at but we can do something small that will make something better for someone else. You can't save everybody, but you can help one person. You can inspire one person. I would never have been an engineer. I was going to be a teacher, at best a science teacher. And if it wasn't for someone nudging me towards engineering, and it was my science teacher, it wouldn't have happened. You need to nudge kids in the direction that you want to get, end up in. We need leadership more than anything. We need people to take the stand. Whether you're leading from behind or you're just doing something where you're a role model in someone's life, we need more leadership. We need to develop people to want to make a change. Engineers hate working in teams because we are so good at doing things ourselves. And engineers tend to be arrogant and they don't listen. We need to force them into a space where they can do these things. And I hope I'm not offending any of the engineers. They know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but teamwork. We need to get together, do these things as a team. You know, it, It's wonderful what happens when we bring other people along to, do, to help us. Being able to communicate your ideas, the beautiful ideas that we have stuck in our heads. We hardly get a, a chance to take that out and to do things like this. This little car took the ideas, took what imagination holds, and it turned it into a reality. And if we, did, if we didn't take that one little step, if we didn't think that we could maybe try, none of the other stuff would have happened. We need to 
expose ourselves to difficult situations because that's when you learn. I try and teach my girl when, when you're struggling, that's when your brain grows. If you're not struggling, it's easy, you know what you're doing, you're not learning anything. You need to struggle through life to get to the other part, to get to the good side of it. You know, when stuff goes wrong, that's in the middle of the night. These kids are so dedicated to this project, they would get out of bed, they were all intense and like, guys, we've got a problem. We're not driving tomorrow. We need to figure out what's wrong. And they would get up and they would work straight through the night. And at the end of that session, they carried the car up a hill so that they could take a good photo <laughs> with the stars and the Milky Way in the Namibian desert in the background. You know, that's dedication to something bigger than yourself. It's not just about the race. We need to teach them how to solve problems, take them through difficult situations. We, de we, never, we hardly ever know what we're doing. We sort of figure it out as we go. So halfway between Swakopmund and Beitepos, which is in the middle of nowhere in Africa, it's strange how when you cross into the borders of sub-Saharan Africa, it feels like you're going to Africa. <laughs> But in the middle of Africa, we broke the third electric motor. So Elanga is pretty high tech. Solar panels, that's what you get on the Mars rover. Motors, 98% efficient. We're driving technology here. It's state of the art. And then we broke the third motor. There's not a lot between us and Betapos. We could stop at Vintuk. We had to find a machine shop that we couldn't convince them to stop production for a day, because if we don't fix Elanga now, we're going to end this trip in the back of a truck, driving home via Gaborone, and that's going to be horrible. What's the fun in that? So we've literally spent a day redesigning our very efficient Australian-made motors. We had to first devise a plan to open them up. These motors are it's at in the bottom of, of the cockpit. We only have one motor, and it's pretty much a disc. It sits in the wheel, held together by a bunch of magnets that spin around as we go. We had to pull these apart. First, we had to figure out how do we pull them apart. Machined the jigs so that it will fit into that lathe so that we can pull it apart and put it back together again, because we were planning on putting it back together again, despite what you think about engineers just breaking stuff. <laughs> so we pulled it apart, figured out what the problem was. Really stupid little problem. Aluminium um, sleeve that was sitting over the shaft had one millimeter in the keyway to hold on. You know, it's going to break. We do thousands of kilometers in Africa. It's going to break. So we redesigned that, machined it, manufactured, assembled, put it back together, and it's switched on again. You know, we never know whether or not she's going to go. Usually she doesn't go when people are watching. <laughs> but it's about how you respond to the challenges. It would have been so easy to say, well, then it's a holiday. You know, we stop here and we carry on and we're going to go on a road trip and we don't have to worry about the car anymore. But we, we want to worry about the car. We want, to, we want to take that message out there. We want to see the kids' faces light up when they see this for the first time. You know, engineering, and I include myself in this, we tend to all think the same. You have to open yourself up to collaborate. You need to open yourself up to new experiences. Get to know the person next to you, down the hall or across the road from you. Get to know your neighbors, not just on the little WhatsApp group where you're complaining about, is your power on? You need to go out there and meet people. We need to engineer a future that we will be excited about. Not just something subpar that we will survive. We need to start thriving. Through this program, through this one little car that we took up into Africa, we had so many other opportunities. We have entrepreneurial skills and working with communities, driving research really at the heart of it. We're co-creating city. That's a Dutch prime minister. He's, he's here right now. That was two days ago. Our students talking to him. More than enough opportunities for us to make an impact. You need to go out there and risk something. <laughs> Thank you.